<laughs> okay, I have some C++ on this talk, but very little. Hi, everyone. Thank you, John. Um, well, this goes too fast. Okay. Um, okay, so I made the title of this talk, Competitive Advantage with D. This took me a while to get to, because what do I, what can I tell to a C++ audience, such a select group of C++ people, um, about D? Because I know you can do anything in C++. What can D really offer you? So I talked, I asked around, even I asked John, and it looked like the whole package seemed to be the winning, um, uh, the winning point for D. So, and then I asked around a little more, and why would anyone use D? And it came to, by looking at the industry use especially, came down to the real deal, actually. What, why do we use programming languages to win at what we do, to produce products, to make money, basically? So then I realized it gives you a competitive advantage. This actually happened after, after receiving an email from my friend Manu Evans. He's uh, a game programmer, used to work at Remedy. So he very nicely summarized why he uses D. Time is money. Time is life, and that's all we have. <clears throat> so, um, how many of you have seen Dan Sachs' 2016 presentation? The one where he uh, repeats, if you're arguing, you're losing. There, um, he mentions, if you want to remember just one thing this talk, so I'm stealing his uh, line there, that's static if. <laughs> so when you look at all the features of D, static if shines. Not by itself, of course, but all the supporting other features around it, like the uh, compile time introspection, um, templates, metaprogramming in general. And let me introduce myself to you a little bit. I am not an alien to the C++ world. I used to be one of you. Um, I followed all the good C++ books. I participated in that awesome news group. I'm a member of the ACCU since 2000, and I sti still am. And as John said, co-organized the Silicon Valley ACCU meetups. I earned my bragging rights. And this exchange, um, I asked one of the ACCU meetup speakers, a relatively younger, I think an intern at Google he was. I asked him, why are you yeah, using C++ instead of these other you know, sexy new programming languages you might like? And his answer was, because it's hard. And it resonated with me because I remember I had pride in being a good C++ programmer because everything is so hard or was hard. I was among that top uh, portion of the people who can come to this conference, basically. I was one of you. And, but around 2007 or so, when C++ OX, now C++ 11, was become, being late, because I learned everything about C++, and I kind of stopped around that time. And looking at my past, in the last two years, the projects I was on moved to Python-like microservices-like infrastructure. So I haven't been a C++ programmer since 2015, actually. And I'm really very grateful to be here. I've already learned a lot from you. I've met wonderful people, and I had wonderful conversations. And then Ali, the D programmer. Uh, it was in 2009, because I'm a member of the ACCU, I got their paper magazine, and Andrei Alexandrescu had an article called The Case for D. Of course, Andrei is very confrontational. He, he actually attacks C++ basically in there. Look how wrong this is, this is better, this is be better. So, but every, as you read it, it made, it made sense to me. And I refer to Dan Sachs again, because I must have been in a correct frame at the time when I read it, because I immediately became a D programmer. It made sense to me. Everything was great. And uh, so another background of myself, I appear on Turkish C++ forums, or I used to. And there are a group of people who don't know English enough or who don't have any computer science education, but they want to program. So as I saw D as being a language being developed still, still, I wanted Turkish documentation for one thing that the Turkish community can benefit from. And I wrote, it, wrote HTML D tutorials in Turkish, teaching programming actually, not specifically D, but I used D as the basis for the, for the book. And then uh, Mengu from the Turkish community especially, and Andre himself, persuaded me to translate it into English. I'm very proud, this is probably the one uh, book, which is here, that was translated from Turkish to English. <laughs> um, and I self-published it uh, in 2015, 
which is freely available actually. The PDF document that makes this book is available. You can take it and print it if you want, or it's HTML and you can download it as an ebook as well. And I keep it mostly up to date. So this printing was rushed to Aspen Meadows, uh, printed in May 2017, actually. I mean, a question to you guys, do you think paper books are still relevant or should we stop them? And this is yours. <laughs> Can you pass this, please? Nothing is signed yet. Um, and, I, and so I had the good fortune of being a founding member of the D Language Foundation, and now I co-organize the Silicon Valley D Lang meetups. And I'm a mere mortal, so nothing else. I wish I were a compiler developer or a Phobos contributor, the standard library contributor. I'm mo mostly an observer. So if you ask me two good questions, you know, difficult ones, I may not be able to answer them. Okay, what about you? So how many of you here use D professionally? All right, awesome. So I, for the record, just one person, one hand I saw. <laughs> How about you used it for some personal project beyond Hello World? Okay, four, four people. Um, how about just the Hello World? Two, four, six, ten. Okay, it's about a dozen. That's great. Um, have you heard it? Heard D, but never tried it? Many, many hands. Okay, just the rest of the crowd. Uh, have you not heard about D at all before this conference? Oh, interesting, so there are two people at least. Okay, is there anybody who still doesn't know what D is? Okay, you drank, <laughs> Barbara drank too much. There are a few hands up there. <laughs> um, thank you, so this is the contents of the talk. I am at, oh, it's not visible, at uh, click 23. There are 222 <laughs> clicks here as a dedication to Barbara and Ansel's room number because most of these slides were finished there. They were a little rushed. So I will give you some history um, and the community of the D, uh, the programming language, some su success stories beforehand, so I'll attract your attention that it's not a hobby language I'm gonna show you. Some general introduction of D, fundamental differences from C++ especially, and the various useful features will be just a bombardment of features. I'll click them very quickly because I don't think I need to explain those features to you. You already know them You're from other languages, C++, or you need them already. And I hope I can get to the software engineering support part because D itself, just its compiler, is also a very, very great tool that helps you with your overall development process. Okay, uh, D was created by Walter Bright. He is a little uh, different from most other computer science people, I guess, because he comes from a mechan mechanical engineering background. He worked at Boeing. But as you know, um, airplane companies are very safety aware. And um, for example, when they make a physical piece, there's only one way of installing that piece. You can't swap it and install it in the wrong way. So the uh, screw holes are a little offset to make it impossible. So he comes from that mindset of if you write a programming language, it should be a safe one. So you shouldn't be able to you know, shoot yourself on the foot basically. So he devours tiny Pascal uh, source code from the Byte magazine, loves it, learns compilers himself. A coworker tells him, so he wrote games start, in Pascal probably, and then he wants to make these games run faster, so he needs to learn how to write compilers. A colleague tells him that quote, and because of that quote, he goes out and writes a C compiler. And has anyone know the Empire game here? Yay, so he's the author of that game. Um, he is the author of the very first actual C++ compiler. Bec if you don't count C front, Strasdrup C front, because it was a translator from C++ to C in his case, but he wrote the very first one. And then writes Digital Mars C, C++, and D compilers. Uh, created D1 in 2001 as a personal project, just for himself. A friend of his pushed it into, I think slash dot it was, a thread uh, opened up and interesting, I read the thread, many people got interested in it. So today if someone posts on Reddit that I have this new language, I say oh, yet another one of those dozens of posts so I probably don't read it. But many people read 
and some people started giving him patches for his language. Um, so Walter Wright, <laughs> probably the, one of the main reasons why D exists is arrays are C's biggest mistake. That's his line. And we had DConf 2017 just two weeks ago. Uh, on the panel with Scott Myers, Andre Alexandrescu, and himself, he said this. <laughs> he made a very bold claim, but Scott Myers did not agree with him. This thread is on Reddit as we speak now. Somebody opened it up there. Um, the second person in the D um, ecosystem is Andre Alexandrescu. I know everyone here knows him. He is the author of Modern C++ Design. And Walter reads Andre's book and implements those extremely difficult template magic stuff into D. So it makes them simple language features. Um, he wrote the D programming language and he is an architect of the language since 2007. <laughs> he jokes sometimes, so he takes D code to C++ conferences. So it's, it's really cheating sometimes to do things in D. Um, okay. And there's a huge community behind D, very vibrant um, forum. Actually, it's a news group, but there's a forum interface to it. Now, okay, I need to tell you something. Walter's, in, uh, Walter's initial uh, project was patched by emails, as I said. Only after 2009 or so, I forgot, they put the projects on GitHub and then it bloomed. Everybody started making open source contributions. There's an IRC channel, um, an annual conference. Um, the last two were held in Ber Berlin. And I say lots of volunteers and some paid individuals, but just like Google Summer of Code, we pay students now, master's students at that university so far, but we're gonna expand this. And these are themselves compiler Experts themselves, you know, very low-level people, they are making great progress. They presented their progress at DConf um, this year. So this is the community. And um, I've already talked a lot about this. This is our DConf. And uh, one thing to point out, actually, the last two bullets. Every presenter at DConf talks about problems with D. They say, this sucks, we need to fix this. For example, the symbol lengths in the compiled file can be megabytes long, in depending on some weird cases. So, but at the end, everyone says, yeah, we had trouble inter, uh, using D. We had trouble putting into our you know, development cycle, but at the end, we, want, we don't want to go back. No, we, we can't do these things, the, the things that we do without D. And all of the uh, presenters uh, show three things at the bottom. Compile time, function execution, that's the, one of the main things that they benefit. User-defined attributes, and design by intro, introspection. Okay, some success stories. Um, Sociomantic <clears throat> is a great success story because it just was a startup company that raised zero dollars or zero Deutsche Marks to start their business, and they've been profitable since day one. They've been an integral part of the ecosystem their developers contribu are contributors to the D system, the uh, runtime compiler and the standard library. Uh, they were the sponsors of DCon for the last two ones, and they are open sourcing their project um, for us to use. And um, a company based entirely on D, and it's not like a. a a slow application, what they do is ad replacement on your, on your website clicks. You go to a click, there's an ad um, rectangle. They quickly identify who you are. They run an online auction between the ad uh, providers and pick the ones who bid the largest in a few milliseconds. So they use D in such a high performance environment. Um, another high performance company is Weka.io which I worked at for nine months. So that's the disclaimer. I have a personal interest in this company, so take what I say with a grain of salt, of course. An Israeli startup company raised $32 million so far, three-year-old startup company. Entire technology is based on D. And their CTO, Liran Zbivel, is a speaker at DCOMS, regular speaker, and he is, he is like an evangelist for D. He says, we couldn't have done any of this without, without D. Um, and now there is a, 
strong Israeli D community sprouting and because the Weka guys are hosting one to two meetups a month. Andrei Alexandrescu was in Israel, he gave four talks. His Google talk is, which is the same as Dconf talk, is on Reddit somewhere or YouTube right now. Remedy games. Um, who here knows Remedy games or have you played their games? So um, Quantum Break, their latest release, is running live decode in there right now. Um, Manu Evans started to integrate D into their development system and they benefited a lot in the development cycle of their games. After Ma Manu left, Ethan Watson took over and he actually started using D in the game and now it's, it's shipping. Uh, you know, games are very high performance uh, applications. A vibe D, this is an open source project. There's no money involved in it. You can use it freely. Um, just an example of how D can be um, short. Uh, you can do this in Python, right? You can create an HTTP, um, HTTP server and say, listen, HTTP, that's a server. And here is an echo um, server. Mm, sorry, later. Here's the echo one. So listen, TCP, and this one is a... The, uh, that syntax down is a lambda, so it's executing that lambda on, by listening to that one. Uh, VibeD is an asynchronous I.O. framework, but you can use it readily as a web application framework. Um, pegged. So one of the some of the features that I'll show you enables you to do these things. Peg means parsing expression grammar, where you can define your grammar in string form, and the red part here is string in my code coloring. You give that string to grammar at compile time. So grammar is a function, nothing else, a function that you could have written, takes the string, parses the string at compile time, generates some code, which is mixed in. You see the mix in there. And then you can, well, oh, this goes a little too fast, okay. Then you can use your new type, which, is, which the grammar mixed in, arithmetic, to have your parse trees for whatever string you give it. One of them, the interesting thing is the first line is an enum, which means that's entirely generated at compile time, the parse tree itself. So at runtime, you will never uh, uh, spend time generating that tree. But the next one is a runtime generated parse tree. Presumably, it gets a runtime string. It doesn't know that. And Bastian Velo, a DCONF 2007 speaker, um, improved PEG to make it available to convert their, uh, I think, extended Pascal, some uh, version of Pascal to D. They are also sold on D, and they're moving their code base. A very security-minded company. They design ships that should float. And he, he gave us examples of how ship design problems can cause disaster, actually. So it's very important for them. Um, Okay, another one. This is old news, actually, but this is another example that shows how powerful it can be. Compile time regexts. This was implemented by a Google Summer of Code student, Dmitry Olshansky. Um, so the first one, the auto, uh, auto is okay. So the regex one is a runtime a regular expression. You give it your domain-specific language, your regex description. It parses your description to know what you want done. But CT regex does that parsing beforehand for you at compile time. So you don't spend time parsing that string. Um, another one, e say it again. You yeah. highlighted the bag in the previous slide. Why is it highlighted? It looks important. Yes, um, not, not important. This is these, uh, the question is, why do I have that exclamation mark highlighted? Because I wanted to say something which I forgot, thank you. So it's the template instantiation uh, expression in D. Uh, template instantiation operator. So CT regex is a template, and that string itself is a template parameter. So D can have string uh, template arguments. So that's the argument to CT regex. Can I make a quick question? Uh, in list, you can transparently exchange uh, a function called for a macro, because there's no different syntax for calling a function and a macro. Uh, in D, you cannot substitute that transparency, right? Because there's a different syntax. Yes, you can't. So templates have two sets of parameters. 
if you want something done in compile time for as a template argument, and, and the question is, I'm sorry, um, in, you said Lisp, right? Yes. In Lisp, macros and functions have no different syntax. You can pass your arguments the same way to them. Yes, no, it's not possible in D. It's very similar to C++. If you have a template argument, you have to give it as a template argument. The runtime parameter is for runtime. You, you can't pass it. You may be able to do tricks with it, but this is very common, common usage. Um, so eBay uses D um, mainly by John Degenhard for data mining. So what they do is all command line tools. They get text files and do things with them maybe analyze some things in them, or in one case, join two files together. Find the matching lines in two files and join them. Um, this one is very important to me because as you will see, D is famous or infamous for no using a garbage collector. John Degenhard did not use um, a garbage collector, uh, sorry, did not worry about the garbage collector, used D as anyone would, and then, um, so what he did is, without worrying about the garbage collector, he wrote his program, profiled it, and then realized that he was making something very naively. I hope this is easy to follow. Um, Sum by key is a hash table, basically, associative array. So in his tight loop, he was getting a key slice, I duping it, I dup means immu immutable copy, and then looking up that entry in the hash table, plus equaling with the value. So it's basically a histogram adding. Because he was doing the I dupe in a tight loop, he was spending a lot of time unnecessarily creating this uh, copy of the key slice. Then he realized, why am I making this every time? The copy of the key slice is needed only when I first in enter this to the table. So he did this. Let me look up the key slice in sum by key. If it's not there, I'll do I dupe, else I'll just use that entry and in, in, uh, in, um, increment my histogram value. By doing this, um, so the green column is his results. He compared his D program to other tools that are commonly used in that domain, like mock, awk, and he named some other common ones as toolkit one, two, three. He's still not exposing which ones got those results. He doesn't want to get into language wars. But look at the results. So his Simple, naive, one-page script-like application gave him this, uh, this result, like uh, four seconds on the left-hand side versus 53 seconds in one tool. Um, there is a mere numerical library out there. Ilya Yaroshenko is working on it. Ilya's approach is different. He passes the better C flag to the compiler, which, dis uh, which disables the garbage collector and the runtime I think, then it may disable other things as well, but he's using it as a, just a better C and producing very high performance. And are you familiar with Glass, Open Glass, all those tools? So he's getting one of the highest performance with it. But again, his approach was different. Uh, Auburn Sounds is a, um, produces commercial audio plugins using the uh, D language, but they go into no GC approach. You can disable the GC garbage collector altogether. And the, so I should have told you, this, these slides, this section is from Simon Arnaud's uh, deconf slides. I'm stealing them. I, gave, I had a note up there. So Simon says, alternatively, you could run your audio handling on a thread that's detached from the garbage collector. You could have done anything you want there while garbage collector did his stuff on the other threads if there were any activity. And this is Simon Arnold's finally uh, own project. He uses D to write a game on bare metal x86 without any operating system. And he is doing horrible hacks to achieve this one. No D runtime, no C runtime, no OS basically. Okay, so there are some other examples. Facebook used it. Andrei Alexandrescu worked at Facebook, so that's one of the reasons why Facebook's developer tools were written in D, some of them. And I'm stealing some other things from the DLang website. This is MVC Web Framework for embedded systems. MC does data-driven uh, modeling. Funkwork is a passenger information system in Europe. So if you've been in a 
uh, bus or train in Europe and you, a passenger information display told you your train is coming in 20 minutes, late 20 minutes, that application is running in D. Um, and there's a question mark. Um, a company, you can watch Andy Smith's presentation at DCOM 2015. They are not telling us what company, but a high scale trading system within a hedge fund group uses D. And just watch their uh, uh, presentation. It's like, when people proposed, why are you doing it that way? It would be faster if you did it. He said, we didn't have a need to. It just worked just fine. Okay, and D appears in academia, not like the Java craze of uh, a couple of decades ago, but Chuck Ellison, do you know Chuck Ellison here? Everybody, yeah, he, he used to be a prominent C++ figure, uh, the editor of the C++ journal, I think the final one. He teaches at Utah Valley University, and he's having um, fun with D, it, it, using D in, in his teaching. And they also, Utah Valley hosted DCOM 2015, and the students are also very appreciative of D. They find it an easy language to work with. Likewise, Carl Startevant used it at University of Minnesota. I think only one summer, though. And there are many MSc and PhD work around the world using D. I know those people from the D forums, of course, in bioinformatics and many other fields. Okay, here's a general introduction of D. Let me see how we're doing. Okay, 57, slide 57, not too bad. Just a resources page. Um, that's the main site. I don't even need to mention this. You can find everything there. And my book is hosted at that site. Um, I have one more, but this goes to my time reminder friend. <laughs> mm. Okay, D and the odds. So D is never a successful language like many others pop up. But, but, um, we're friends here so I can use names. When Swift comes as the Apple's language, everybody looks at it, you know, every eye goes on it. Or Go comes as the Google's language or Nico explained us Rust, Mozilla's language. There are these um, attractive things in many other languages where people go there immediately. D doesn't have any of those things. For example, D doesn't take anything away from the programmer. And this is a quote from my friend Norm Hardy. He said, every successful programming language limits the programmer in, in some way. D doesn't do that. You can, it's a system programming language basically. There's a no major corporation support behind it. It has no killer app. Apparently some people are saying D needs a killer app because there are examples of other languages for a killer app. There's no killer app. Maybe Vibe D is a good example, but it's not a killer app. It doesn't have a favorite paradigm. Object-oriented programming, you can do it. Uh, template metaprogramming, you can do it. C-like programming, you can do it. No favorite kind of programmer. So this is a... <laughs> It doesn't, it's not for academia or industry or anybody, or it's not for a fresh engineer or an experienced one. It's, anyone can use it, especially not for geniuses. But this is something for C++ actually, a comment I heard about 15 years ago, where people were just, uh, thinking C++ is so hard. There was a saying like, C++ is not meant for everybody. It's for you know, the higher class. I don't know whether the genius people or whether people who spend time bringing themselves up. There was such a quote. There's nothing like that for D. Anybody can program in, program in it and have fun. There's no problem domain. It's not for web or embedded systems or anything. Uh -huh. It doesn't have a favorite memory management strategy. It's open to garbage collection and it uses garbage collection in its runtime. It's there. <clears throat> um, another one. This pops up. Another question of mine to a very prominent C++ person. He, at the ACCU meetups, he was explaining some uh, promise and future-based graph hierarchy, setting it up at runtime. And I said, this would be very easy in D. And I asked him, have you looked at D? And his response was, a language with reference types. No, thanks. So, so D doesn't have that either. It's okay with value types and reference types. It has both of them. And sorry, if you program in D, you don't get bragging rights. It's easy. And no facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> if you Google for it, all successful languages have facial hair. D architects don't. So that's why 
it's not a successful language. Um, so familiar, uh, a general introduction of the language, you already assume this is true. You know, if you're coming to C, C++, Java, C Sharp, everybody finds something familiar in it. You, it's not an alien language. And that's by design. Walter wanted a language that looked like C, basically. And then he brought in features from other languages. Some people claim it can look like compilable Python because the higher level view of it, which comes with zero cost abstractions, is Python-like. It's strongly statically typed, with, just like C++, basically. Um, it has very powerful templates and compile time features are the, he, it's a king language when it comes to compile time features. Multi-paradigm system language, both low level and high level, you can do bit twiddling any way you want, but it gives you very high level abstractions too. Compiles fast, this is very important and this was an initial design goal as well. Anastasia explained yesterday how JetBrains has horrible difficulty parsing what a certain piece of C++ code is. D doesn't have that problem. It's very friendly both to the programmer and the tool because um, Walter actually wanted a language that's easily parsable, uh, compilable for himself because he's a compiler writer. He made it a very simple language for, that, uh, for the tool as well. It executes fast, just like C++. It's, it runs native code. It readily links with C, another design goal. If you have a C library, your favorite library, which is not written in D, all you need to do is uh, write function declarations for that library, because you, as you will see, D cannot understand header files. You need to have the equivalent of function declarations on the D side, which is the almost one-to-one -one mapping one. You just say, this is foo takes int returns double, you're done. And then you link them together and it's C ABI compatible. You will call your functions and be happy with it. Of course, you can wrap a D wrapper around those bindings or not. And C++ actually, so there's a joke. D is the only language that can call C++. <laughs> C++ included. <clears throat> <laughs> so, <clears throat> however, it doesn't contain a C++ compi compiler, of course. What it does is it understands the name mangling schemes. So if you have a binding of a C++ symbol saying, oh, foo takes int returns double, by the way, it's in the namespace such, 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 a dot B dot C, and then D knows how it's name mangled and links with that um, name for you. There are still open the holes with this scheme, uh, linking with C++, like exceptions. If one, it needs to understand C++ exceptions. So there are some issues there, but mostly um, it, it's happily usable. Facebook actually used their C++ libraries with D, but they had to have a wrapper in between. They had to drop their C++ to C, uh, um, layer, and they represented their exceptions in a certain way, then it went to D, and it came back. So it's doable, but still not freely, right, um, easily available. Okay, a language that you can do RAI, garbage collection, resource, um, reference counting, manual management, anything you want. And it's designed by community, that we have a D improvement proposal uh, process, <coughs> You open one up, first start the discussion on the forums, of course, you write it up and your proposals come in. Uh, it used to be that some features just snuck in by Walter without telling anyone, please. So if a function in D invokes C or C++ function, can that C or C++ function invoke D function? Yes, the question is, if I call a C function from D, can that function invoke a D? Yes, D is also callable by C and C++. However, you have to declare your function signature as extern C, just like you would do in C++. <coughs> <coughs> uh, so one feature was implemented by Walter behind the scenes. That was the user-defined attributes requested by Manu Evans uh, while he was working at Remedy Games. So he contacted Walter secretly, let's say, so he convinced Walter user-defined attributes were a great thing, and Walter implemented them. So of course, the community said, what, what happened to my other favorite feature? You didn't work on it, but did it. But today, there's no such thing. We have <coughs> dips. <coughs> Compilers. 
Um, all of these compilers are free and open source. <coughs> I'll get to DMDs um, un un being non-free later on. So DMD is the reference compiler. This is what Walter writes. Uh, luckily, DMD's front end is decoupled from its back end. So that front end feeds into LLVM. And the LLVM uses its awesome back end to produce uh, code under the name LDC. Same happens with GDC. The same front end plugs into GCC's back end. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so there are many people who are into compilers in the D community, and there are many compilers in progress. Some of them are, uh, some of them creating their own compilers as a library, so that you can link with this library, compiler as a library. And D is scriptable as well. When you install it, it comes with an RDMD binary. Write your D code down there with the hash bank symbol executes code. Even you can put D code on the command line because RDMD has an eval option. You can put a string there and execute it. <clears throat> but it's not one of my favorite features. I'm an old school source code compile execute kind of person, but some people really like this. <clears throat> Hardware support, it was originally designed for x86. But because of LDC and GDC, you have these other platforms as well. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, for example, at DCOM 2017, there is DCompute, which is um, making D, so writing a D application without worrying what the backend platform is um, on a heterogeneous system, is what I'm trying to say. You may have GPUs, FPGAs, CPUs at the backend, so your D application will be abstracted away from the CPUs, and DCompute is trying to achieve that. And DHDL is an interesting one. It's a, an achievement by a good friend of mine, Luis Marques. Um, Luis Marques created a, a D language, well, not D language, but he used D language to program FPGAs, and he implemented a CPU in the FPGA by his D language tools, and ported Walter's Empire on that FPGA, on that CPU, and live demo, he showed us how he to play Empire at DCONF. So these things are possible. <clears throat> okay, D is not pristine, is not awesome. We have our WATs, we have our warts. And I will not tell all of them to you. <clears throat> you figure those out yourself. Some of them come from the C and C++ legacy. For example, we have the wrong default sometimes. Um, muti mutable is the default one. If you have a variable, it's mutable. So some people like it should be immutable by default and you want a mute keyword. Nope. Um, we have integer promotion rules and uh, especially, they are very confusing, you know, from signed to unsigned. Many people have difficulty with this, especially people who don't come from C and C++. Other programming language people don't understand how crazy these things are. Is it possible in D to create a user-defined equivalent of A, which would be rid of the original problem, <coughs> and yet has the same runtime efficiency as the native A? Yes. So the question is, can you write a user-defined int replacement with its own policies when it comes to these rules, integer promotions, without any abstraction cost, basically? It is possible. and. Um, you were asking very timely, again two weeks ago, Andre Alexandrescu, while explaining, his, while going through his presentation about design by introspection, he used checked int, which I have a slide later on, but thanks for bringing it front. So checked int is something where you can um, design yourself. I don't care about overflow. Or you can say, if underflow happens, abort my application. Or do this. Just spontaneous questions and discovery are completely new. That, that's great, but a very good point. I mean, I should have put that right after this. Yeah. Okay. So when people look at D, if they object, they object for, I think, four main reasons, and that's my observation. They uh, complain that the reference compiler is not open source. That used to be true until very recently. <coughs> Because some part of the backend was owned by Symantec through some legal things. 
You never had any problem in practice. You could use that compiler to create your application without any um, threats on it. You could. But people wanted open source, open source. Some people couldn't uh, accept D for that reason. But thanks to Symantec, who happens to be or used to be our ACCU meetup sponsor as well, they just gave the rights away. So it's now completely open source. Though this is not true anymore. Some people complain, oh, D has this split community problem. Some people go this way, some people go that way. This used to be true. And that was caused by D being a one-man show. People got frustrated giving patches to Walter and waiting for them to go in. So they created their open source uh, collaborative environment and called it Tango. I have the name there. And um, however, Tango was not compatible with the existing D's runtime, so it's a different kind of standard library with a different runtime. <coughs> uh, at some point, we said we can't have this split, and everybody settled on the standard Phobos, which is the um, standard library of D. And Tango has since been ported to Phobos. This is years ago story. You know, when I was in D, this was a thing happening. So this is not true anymore. There is no split community in D. <coughs> Everybody object to D because it has a garbage collector. I have a slide, uh, two slides about this. I'll get to that. And as I said, some people complain about D because it has reference types. Like, and like uh, understandably, because I had that problem too. I was a C++ programmer. Everything is value types in C, C++. That must be the right thing. Uh, Walter initially chose Java and C Sharp approach. C Sharp, I think, is the right one. Structs are value types. Classes are reference types. That's how it is. OK, garbage collector. So I, this, I had this, we need to talk, my friends, <laughs> kind of point here. Because I know you also object to garbage collection. Because that's understandable. You don't want these uh, surprise delays, lags in your application. No Say it again. No <laughs> Who doesn't have garbage? We. Oh, we, yes. C++ does not have garbage. <laughs> I know. However, garbage collection is an accepted automatic memory management invented by John McCarthy in 59, serving humanity since then. And if you look at his Wikipedia entry, it's not one of those topics which has a controversy or objection kind of title. It's, it's there. It's a normal thing. And I bet some of you here took advantage of garbage collection during your development if you used any dynamically typed language like Python. Have you? OK. So, so it's the, the thing is, garbage collector itself is not bad. You don't want it in your hot, hot code, hot path. So I, I think the problem, one problem D has is, it is both a system programming language and also your prototyping language. That's why the ease that comes with prototyping languages must be in this language as well. You want to prototype quickly. So that's why you need garbage collector. You take good advantage of it. And some C++ people think garbage collection is OK. I'm sure you're um, aware of Herb Sutter's work, right? And just search for it if you're not. Um, and interestingly, garbage collection can be the fastest options. Uh, is John Lakos here? He's going to beat me because I made a connection with what he said with a garbage collector. Of course, his allocator talk had nothing to do with garbage collectors. But at some point, he showed us performance figures saying, if you wink out your objects without running destructors, without deallocating that memory, ooh, very fast performance. So garbage collectors can be seen as infinite memory. You create objects. There's no guarantee that that object will be destroyed or it's going to be deallocated. So you get that performance benefit automatically. Of course, it's not all good. We'll talk about that. OK, let's talk about D's garbage collector. Because there are different kinds of garbage collectors. And uh, I know garbage collection from bad reputation from Java myself. Never used it, but I have uh, knowledge about that. OK, slide 90, 93, and we're at halfway point. So some people think D's garbage collector runs on a separate thread and stops everything and does garbage collection. That's not true. 
your application is just like a C++ application. Main starts on one thread and you're executing your code. It doesn't collect at random times, but you have to be aware when it does. It collects when you dynamically allocate memory. That's all. You dynamically allocate, it runs a collection cycle. If you don't dynamically allocate, garbage collection is not there for you. If you want, you can disable garbage collection before your hot loop. You call disable, it's not going to collect, you do your business, and then you can enable it later on. Or sometimes you can take, uh, ask the garbage collector to collect the cycle now so that there's no surprises in the coming section of your code. You can ban the garbage collector at compile time from certain parts of your code. You can put the at no GC attribute to a function, possibly to your main application, main uh, function, and there's no garbage collection for you. This is compile time checked, so you can't call garbage collecting functions. If you compile your application with dash VGC, you get uh, line numbers where your allocations are. If you profile equals GC, you compile with those features or run with that feature, it tells you how many cycles it ran, how many milliseconds it took. And garbage collection can live with your own memory uh, allocation techniques, memory management techniques, malloc, you know, everything is available to you. Okay, and these garbage collector is not the best in the world. It's one of those stop the world kind of garbage collector. Uh, in the no GC function, or if you stick it to main, mm -hmm. uh, that is how you free memory. Can you still call, for example, GC collect inside the no GC main? No, the question is, if you use uh, at no GC, then how do you collect? At no GC means you cannot allocate from D runtime's dynamic memory anymore. You can use malloc, you can use any other technique, any other allocator, but you're on your own in that case. You manage it manually. Um, and a caveat, if you do at no GC, some of the standard library is not available to you because some of the functions in there do use the runtime's memory allocation. Okay, uh, we, it's not the best garbage collector, it's not multi-threaded. But Sociomantic has a multi-threaded garbage collector, which is unfortunately in D1, an older version of D. They are porting it to D. We're waiting for it. And also, the garbage collector is not precise. Any integer value that looks like a pointer uh, may be assumed to be a pointer holding on some memory. These two are the problems. And I think the imprecision of this garbage collector comes from the fact that this is a system language. You can put any pointer in your long, basically. You can play with those tricks. And D cannot assume you didn't play those tricks. Okay, one example of garbage collection. This is just a multi-threaded program. The top main spawns a worker. And in that for loop, it's creating different sized arrays. And note the immutable keyword there. It just creates an immutable array, sends it to the worker thread, and the worker thread receives it as an immutable int and plays with it. So who owns this memory? Who should own this memory? The producer? The consumer? With a garbage collector, you don't have that question. You make your buffers, put them there, people use them. When they're done, it's done. Garbage collector will take care of that buffer for you. So this is one benefit. Okay, the other objection. D has reference types. Yes, question. So, I, I think garbage, garbage collection makes sense, but the alternative is the manual memory, memory management, it's not just small. We have smart pointers that are big pointers and sure pointers. Yes. And I feel like that's a cleaner solution of dealing with the issue of allocation and ownership, and that's also backed up by this semantic. So, is there anything in D like that? If I don't want to use the GC, but I want to use unique pointers, can I have that? And can I be sure there's only one owner? Yes, the question is memory management is good, but alternatives are also good. You can have shared pointer, you can have unique pointer. Do we have the equivalent in D? Yes, we have some in the uh, standard library. We have other mechanisms of doing it. So one of them is, you know, the scoped the allocation idiom. You allocate something, right underneath you say, when you exit this scope, execute this function. RAI, basically. So we have them in D as well. And Attila Nevesh, 
a community member of the C++ as well and D, he just wrote AutoMem, which mimics certain C++ features in D as well. So you can do all of those too. Great, but what about the thread transfer question? I've uh, allocated some memory, tell it to clean it up. I'm going to get that memory to something else and then now what? Uh, you mean, in, are, you, are you asking in regards to shared pointer? I'm yes. not top of the question. Okay. So the question is, if we go back to the, this threaded one, what if we use a shared pointer here? Oh, in D, in D yeah. context you're asking. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, if there is a construct of the allocated memory, then I give this memory to something else. And yes, yes. Uh, so the question is, can we do a shared pointer, unique pointer in D in this context? Yes and no. So D has a keyword called shared. One default that D got right is uh, memory is th thread local by default. So as opposed to C++, in order to share something, you have to make it shared. So in that, which is a type attribute, so in that case, you would have to pass a shared special type, which would take care of that uh, memory for you. Um, okay, I feel honest. There are wats and warts in that section with the shared keyword. It's not complete. There are questions about its semantics. We get by, we're happy with it, but it's not the best implementation or design yet. Okay, the value type versus class uh, reference type difference in D. So the claim is from the D people, when you design your type, it's usually very well understood whether it's a value type or a uh, reference type. For example, point is a value type, it's just x and y coordinates. My action, in the other hand, on the other hand, is a reference type. It inherits from action, and, and I'd say reference type because here comes my anti-pattern that I've used to do. When I coded in C++, this was very common for me. I would create a class, and I would immediately type def its shared pointer version and call it full PTR, and I traded this full PTR in the application to functions from functions. I know it's an anti-pattern, you don't have to you shouldn't pass shared pointer into a function. But for me, this was a reference type. And also, reference type uh, eliminates a group of questions. You don't have slicing problem anymore. Your class objects go as pointers to those objects behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about copying because it's not relevant. No assignment operation and no moving for you. Okay, D also drops unwanted legacy. A question, another. So to add the trigger in D, it has a value type as a reference, which you return a reference to a value type, and stuff like that. The question is, can I also pass a value type as a reference in D? Yes, you can. We have the ref keyword. Yes, it's possible. The so, way say it again? The other yeah. way around? Uh, no, class object is sitting on the runtime memory somewhere. You have just a handle to it. However, you can uh, emplace your class object into a stack uh, memory or any other memory that you allocated. So you can emplace a class object there and now you know where it sits. It's possible also. Yes, I answered your question. We have the ref keyword. Uh, so in general, structs actually are sufficient. You can implement your own ref uh, semantics in structs using these, you know, the, the structs have all the power. Classes are just a convenience. Um, and in general, object-oriented programming and classes are not in fashion anymore in D world as well. The people don't really go that path. They go to structs and functions, you know, freestanding functions most of the time. Okay, so D has resemblance to C and C++, but many legacy features are dropped. We don't have the preprocessor. We're done. One language that could get rid of macros finally, or the entire header files. No zero terminated strings, because strings are pointer plus length instead. And to answer something about, I saw Rust strings had also the capacity in there, so it was a length plus capacity. D doesn't use that scheme, it has, it's a pointer plus length. They can grow, but capacity is handled by the runtime by its own magic, which I don't fully understand. It has less implicit conversions, and some C++ people don't like this feature. They want to be able to have implicit conversion of their, uh, for example, I want to pass int to a function, and if that function takes uh, my int, I want that automatic. D doesn't allow this. You have to explicitly say, I'm passing 
a myint and you have to make your myint on the call side. Some C++ people don't like this, but it's how it is. Uh, we dropped the octal literal, literals. You can't make mistakes in D in this regard, which one of my favorite, favorite bugs early on in my career was an octal bug like this. This is a compilation error. You can't put a zero in front of a literal like that. We almost killed the comma operator, but you really cannot kill it because people use the comma operator in the for loops, in the iteration part. I++, comma, J++ is common. So the, the compiler actually makes sure what you're doing there. Are you losing values? So it cripples some users of the uh, comma operator, not all of it. It's still there, but very much crippled. Uh, so D, uh, Walter actually told me this over breakfast again two weeks ago. Why do we have to support 16-bit platforms? Why do we have to support 17-bit um, fictional character sizes? There's no such thing anymore. So it, it's, it agrees on a char is 8 bits, done. Or an int is 32 bits. I think it's here, yes, done. Long is always 64 bits. This is platform independent, the D language defines it that way. Except one type, the fundamental type, that's real. So D has float and double, just like in C++, the IEEE types. Real can be your maximum precision floating point on your platform. So if you use real, your results may be not, you, you may not know what it is. On this platform, you may get an 80-bit uh, real, on the other one, 128 real. So that's the only one that's platform dependent. Uh, so another idea of Walter, there shouldn't be warnings as much as possible. If your program makes sense, compiles and runs, other, or there's a questionable something there, that's an error. So it goes that, that way. The D prefers this one. Um, for example, no shadowing declarations. I'm not exactly sure what this is. Walter told me this, but this feature of this saved him from many hours of debugging, he said. So a declaration cannot shadow another one and you suddenly, I, I, it feels like hijacking to me, but I don't really understand what he meant with that. Oh, no lexical ordering of declarations. Look, main is calling foo and foo is defined under main. We don't have this moving code around uh, issue with D. You just write it as long as it's mod module scope. It's there, it'll be called. Okay, how are we doing? 119, I'm a little behind actually. So some fundamental differences from C++, some of which we have already talked. Um, void main, so this is like a joke because in C++ forums, one of the things I've done myself. Hey, it's not void main, it should be int main. We don't have this problem, void main is legal. Um, if your program runs successfully, it returns zero itself. If it terminates with an exception, it returns one itself. Of course, you can have int main, but void main is standard. It has a cleaner syntax, as I described. I think it comes from a compiler friendliness of D. Um, I, again, Anastasia, a reference to Anastasia's, she also said module systems help, and D uses a module system, it helps uh, with that. Uh, one simple example, many people don't hate semicolons, I'm not one of those, but Python people, um, you know, don't want it, and some syntax is cleaner, see, struct definitions, for example, don't need a semicolon after that definition. Um, templates are much less noisy, at least we think so. Two is a, a function template there, and after the bang is int, it's a template argument, so you can say to int this string. Or we have UFCS, which makes reading very nice. I have another slide for it. Um, you can put str.toInt, or you can drop empty parentheses on functions. So this comes very handy uh, because uh, property-like syntax becomes very clean. You can say my type dot length as if it's a length property, but it may be a function behind the scenes doing work. So we think it's clean. There first. How, how powerful is UFCS? Can you, can you extend an existing type by providing a function that takes you? Yes, how powerful is UFCS is the question. I have a slide for that. It's an extremely simple feature. 
And you get to these extremely simple features of D. One of them is unit testing, actually. All UFCS does is this. Mm, when the slide comes, I'll show that, sorry. It'll be easier. Another question? I was just wondering how you get a pointer to the two int method if you know if there's a way to refer to it to just call it without current. Um, so the question is, how would you get a pointer to the two int method? Yeah. Well, then you wouldn't pass an str to that pointer access. Oh, okay. You would use an ampersand to int, and you would get the address of that template instantiation. Oh, but how, how do I then tell which overload that it wants? Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, but to int, in this case, the int is the overload, in this case. Oh, I see what you mean, because two has two template parameters. Yes. The question, how, how, which one I get? Mm, I've never tried that. You would probably, um, I, I've never tried that. Yes, yes, that's what I'm thinking too. If you mention both template parameters and then ampersand, I think that's the way to get that uh, instantiation. Okay, we have just 30 minutes and we're awfully behind. I couldn't show you any good things yet. Um, Lambda syntax is very clean. I've seen this proposed for C++ as well. So foo is a function taking a lambda and it means given a produce a times two. That's the lambda. Um, some syntax cleanup from C, which I'm a very big fan of. When you define arrays, you don't put the array size after the variable name. It's consistent. So it's like int 42 of those. It's consistent because if you have array of arrays, then you say int three. So it's an int three of ints, three ints, and four of those. So that declaration is four in threes. So it's always type and the size, so it's very consistent. And we dropped the pointer access uh, operator. Arrow is gone, you just say pointer.member because the language knows it's a pointer. So that works that way. There are some corner cases here because D has type attributes. You can say pointer.size of. It's the size of, of the pointer, size of the pointer, but it kind of clashes with the syntax, but you have to be aware of that. So there are some corner cases there. Oh, this goes too fast. Likewise, similar to C's array syntax, C's function syntax is also fixed. So int function double means the type of a function that takes a double and returns int. So if you have a function pointer that returns a function pointer, it's very consistent again. Like bar is a function taking string returning a function taking double and returning it. So this makes coding very simple. Yes? Uh, are functions, like when you pass a function to another function and you use the syntax, is it type array by default? Like if I pass a lambda, is it going to be in line? What parameters do I have in that? So if we pass a function to another function, is it type erased by default? No, because it's a statically typed, strongly typed language. Even though lambda doesn't have any types there, you can think of it as a variadic template, not variadic, but one item template. The type is inferred, and from that point on, you can't use it as a different type. So it's not like STD function, it's, it's a language thing. Yes, yes, it's a language thing and it's, it has its own type. Okay, and many more cleanup, cleaner syntax. One thing very different from um, C++, that Every single type has a dot init property and it gives you the initial value of that. Even your user type struct s has a dot init and pragma message is a compile time printing facility. You can see what's happening. So s, s's init value is that. Int gets zero. Floating points are lucky because IEEE gives us the option to define a not a number there. Ints don't have that luxury so we pick zero. And this is very interesting, very different from many other languages. Char is nothing but a UTF-8 code unit, nothing else. It's not a byte. If you're using it as a byte, you're making a mistake because we have byte and u-byte for those purposes. That's why the initial value of char is FF, uh, UTF-8 value, which happens to be the Unicode illegal value. You can't use it. Okay. If you want a different init value for your struct, you just assign different values for that struct. However, this is not a constructor. This is 
the type S with that special um, initial value. In practice, what happens is, of course, it's a bit representation of all those things in memory. Whenever you make an S later on, presumably or conceptually, those bits are copied into your variables as its initial value. You can define your constructors, but now you get that different initial value. Auto, this is a very small uh, uh, trivia in here. In C++, auto means automatic type inference. In D, there's no keyword for automatic type inference because it's already there. That's why I can say const a equals 42. Because the language syntax knows it's a variable declaration and that's an int. You need auto only when there's nothing else to say. When you need a mutable one, basically. So auto historically regains its initial meaning in uh, D. It means automatic storage class. So the C meaning died and became a white noise word for a while, sorry, white space word, and then re uh, revived. Okay, something very different from C++. There are no references to R values, even if the reference is to a const. I think this compiles in C++. There's no way in D, you can't do this. Um, turtles all the way down, another huge difference. This is a C++ code. I have struct B, has a struct A inside it, composition style, and A happens to have a pointer. I'm creating a const B, which has a const A inside, but the pointed data down there is not const. In C++, I can do this, change that into a 43, and this compiles and works. This is not acceptable, or was not acceptable to Walter, and it's turtles on the way down. If you have a const object, entire state that object can be represented by is const. So that's a compilation error in D. This is, um, this trips people sometimes. This is too restrictive when people who come from C and C++ find this too restrictive sometimes. Okay, in addition to const, we have immutable. Const has the same meaning as in C++ in, in some uses. It means I cannot mutate uh, this data, but others may, especially in the case of const reference, right? Your function receiving a reference to const, it's a promise that you're not gonna change it. Immutable says it really is immutable. There's nothing else. Um, so immutable is a great thing because immutable is shared by default. If you remember that multi-threaded application, there was no shared keyword there. If something is immutable, it's not thread local anymore. Your other threads can use it because it's only read-only access to that data. No locking needed, no copying needed. Uh, no copying needed is very interesting, actually. Let's say you have a um, file object that takes the file name as a string in its constructor. In C++, you have to copy that name into your member string. Otherwise, you can't rely on the reference that's re given to you. It can disappear and you may have a dangling reference or people may modify that string. You want the file name in that file object, let's say. If it's immutable, you can take it as an immutable in your constructor, which requires your user to give you an immutable data, and you don't need to copy anymore because string is a garbage collected type immutably sitting for you, for your use. So it removes a copy need there. In your string example, the string S is it an immutable object or? Say it again, please. Yes. S is the uh, immutable object? Or? I will get to that, but strings are, are mutable arrays of immutable UTF-8s. So the elements are immutable, but you can append things to it. Which detaches you from the original source. So if you attach more items to S, high would sit there as an immutable to serve other users of it but then your new S would be a different string in memory. That would copy. <coughs> so if you had written auto S equal high instead of string S equal high, same thing. of S would have been immutable of high. Same thing, yes. So the literals translate to strings by default. So there's a sort of chaos or construction which happens here. Those are, the type on the left and on the right are not the same. Um, there is no stood string equivalent of the 
So that literally you see is the string type. That's a pointer and a length, that's all. It doesn't make an implicit type construction. String is not a type, it's basically that a fundamental thing. Okay, um, I wanna show you more stuff. Um, suffice to say on this set of slides that we don't have the move problem in D. Our values are copied by default. This doesn't work. This is too long, but what, what happens is the language knows that you are passing an R value, then that R value is moved. And remember, classes don't have R value problem. There are no R values for classes. A struct R value is moved bitwise. So you're done. We don't have move constructor concept in it, in D. What you need is, um, and also I should add this, structs are very much lower to C as opposed to C++ structs in D. They are actually bit values. Copying is also very shallow. It's a bitwise copy, which may be the wrong thing. And when copy happens, which we call blit, you need to, and if that's a dangerous operation, you implement that special post blit function to take care of it. Post blit gets called when you're shallowly copied, then you go ahead down and duplicate your elements or whatever you need it. However, move problem is not there. Things are moved automatically. Our values are. As I said, we have a module system, no includes. And as we've talked about this, you can have referred to symbols down the same. Okay, C arrays, I'm not gonna read this to you. C arrays are C's biggest mistake. You can argue with Walter if you read that article. Uh, so D has two separate array syntaxes. One is fixed length arrays. Int three is fixed length, and it's nothing but three elements in memory. There's no pointer to it. There's no size to it. Even the size is a part of the type. Three elements sitting there. So that's why if you say array five, that's a compilation error, because its type doesn't have a fifth element there, or sixth. Um, Done, so that's a static array. Static arrays are value types, that's another interesting thing. So if you copy a static array to another one, you get a copy of it. Now we have dynamic arrays. The syntax is similar, the only exception is there's no size anymore. It's a dynamic array of ints. You can start, um, D dropped the plus operator from string concatenation or array concatenation, we use tilde. So tilde equals is append, tilde is concatenate. If you have a dynamic array and you're accessing an invalid index, that's a runtime problem. Okay, strings. As we talked, we have three string types, char, wchar, dchar, and they are those, but nothing else. The language is aware of Unicode and will move your string type depending on the UTF-8 encoding. You will pull out actual Unicode characters, but you, if you want, you can walk um, code unit by code unit as well, but the language is aware. As we talked, we have three um, aliases to these. And they are just Unicode strings themselves. The entire source code and the runtime is Unicode aware. Okay, back to slices. This one is the biggest useful feature of D, according to some people. This is very similar to uh, string view in C++ basically, but baked into the language. If I have an, that array with four elements, one to three means 20 and 30. No copy happened, it's just a view into, into that. And there's a palindrome function, is palindrome. Uh, if zero and dollar is a shorthand for length, length minus one equals, and is palindrome. So I shrink the view from both ends, recursively call myself. And this is, a bad program because it assumes ASCII. You shouldn't take one code unit from the top and the end because you're slicing into one Unicode character there. Yes. Is this type require garbage collection? Yes. Slices depend on garbage collection. And, yeah. and the arrays. say it again. And, and dynamic arrays. Yes. The strings are nothing but dynamic arrays. And dynamic arrays and strings are the same things, just the type is different. 
So this convenience is why D has garbage collection. We can do these things in memory, and if you use at no GC, you can't do these operations. So it's gonna cripple you. Question. Can I be, wouldn't I be able to get a slice to a statically allocated? Yes. Question is, continue, please. Even with no GC. Yes. You can have a no GC static array. The question is, can I have a slice into a static array? Yes, yes, slicing has no problem with no GC. The tilde operations have problems with no GC, sorry. Appending and concatenation. Any operation that needs a new location needs the garbage collector or the dynamic memory. Okay. And a good question that reminds me, as I said, static arrays are nothing but elements sitting in memory. They don't have pointer, they don't have length. So you access those arrays with dynamic array syntax as well. You get a slice to the whole thing. So slice itself is, I think I passed that too quickly. Slice in memory is length plus pointer pair. Static arrays, your malloc memory, they are not slices, they are just memory with elements. Then you have a slice to it and start using it. Okay, I think I'm gonna fly through because I'm not where I wanted to show you. The language has associative arrays, hash tables basically baked into the language. Nothing interesting there. Oh, this is the universal function call syntax. We said we have a slide about that. So if you have a function called minutes taking an int, you can call it in the usual syntax or you can do what I've shown you earlier, 10.minutes. Extremely simple feature. If 10.minutes does not compile, meaning if int doesn't have that member variable or any other type, sorry, member function, the compiler says, let me try this UFCS, the anti-UFCS version and tries the top line and calls that one. This is the opposite of what C++ adopted, I think, right? You have something similar where member functions can be called like regular functions, if I'm not mistaken. There's no consensus on that. Oh, it's not in yet? Okay. Yes, because it's already a member function, you can call it as a member function. If you need a, fun a free function, you can write a free function, I guess, to call the member of the thing. Yeah, but, but this is the right direction. If C++ can learn something from D, I will show you a syntax, and you, you guys already know this, this is the right design here. No problem. You can pass module boundaries with it, yes. If, as long as that symbol is in there, yeah. Um, oh, here it is, why this is the right decision. Look at this call. You have to read this from inside out. I start with values, multiply all of those by 10, divide those by three, I get the even numbers in that one, this is a filtering operation, and then write those. So, in C and C++ or many other languages, we can't chain expressions like this because it's too unreadable. Then what you do is you put, take parts of this and create temporary local variables to make it readable. With UFCS, it turns into this. That rule up there makes you write this. Start with values, multiply by 10, and this is nothing but that syntax, just in readable form. Shows you the chained expression. And this is extremely powerful because D has ranges, and you can create a chain of ranges that collectively work as an engine sitting there doing this, but lazily. Only as you pull items from it, this whole contraption does its job and gives you elements. Oh, it's right here, actually, ranges. A big shout out to uh, Eric Nibbler, actually. I personally thank him for uh, basing C++'s range example on HSTOs, D community members, awesome work, that calendar application. If you haven't watched it, you should. And you should also read this forum thread if you're interested in it because it puts lots of history into how G the ranges came to be. And personally, I have some um, recollection about that. When I was on Complang C++ moderated, I remember an individual trying to sell the range idea instead of iterators to C++. He was saying iterators are no good, we need ranges. Meaning we need to put the begin and end together into a concept. 
so that we can chain operations on them, just like the previous slide. So D benefits tremendously with this, and apparently that same individual was also in the D community, and he convinced um, Walter to add ranges to D. Huge, huge benefit. This, uh, this is an amazingly useful tool. And this makes lazy evaluation, and this makes eBay's data tool beat all the other people that well. Because the contraption my friend built there is a lazily evaluated, give me line by line kind of contraption. Okay, quickly, various useful features. Let me see. Okay, we have concurrency and parallelism. Uh, this is a very good one. If you have an array of students, in the um, iterative way, it takes four seconds because you have four students. All you need to do is dot parallel at the end of the students. And again, if you remember from UFCS, this is actually a freestanding function. This goes down to parallel students, which returns a special type, which does multi-thread running parallelization for you automatically. Now it's in one second. I'll pass this very quickly. We have fibers as a feature of both the runtime and the library. And look at this tree traversal, how beautiful it is. Bryce had a lightning talk, no, was it on the lightning talk, where you had your matrix uh, elements being yielded with co-yield? So we have this in the language, very clean syntax. Symmetrical or not? Say it again? Symmetrical or not? Oh, I don't know what that means. Uh, it allocates a stack at least, I know that much. It's, these are not stackless fibers. Uh, what do you mean with symmetrical or not? I can't answer the question. I don't know the answer. Um, the corresponding part is call. So the owner of the fiber calls call, and the fiber says yield to come back. So they ping pong between the two stacks. Some other good syntax, I passed that. We have functional programming features, immutable we talked about. We have pure functions. Lazy evaluations are very common. Here is that one of those contraptions. So it says, Start with the input. So look, look at the slice syntax. Uh, arguments are passed as string arrays to D, to the main function. So I'm dropping the first one out, which is the name of the program. So give me all the input command line numbers, map them to long, because they are strings, convert them to long, filter them with this, so give me the odd numbered ones, and sum. So again, uh, this is not lazy though, because everything is on the command line. So it then, this prints nine with this kind of functional programming laziness built in it. Pure code, I'll say just one thing. D is pure, is very permissive, just like what, what Nico talked about, Rust. It's okay to mutate stuff in your thread local storage. So this is a pure function, but all those highlighted parts are mutations, actually, because you're playing with your own stack variables. That should be allowed, and D allows this. Compile time function execution, we talked about this. You can execute any function at compile time as long as it's possible. Ah, templates. I have to show you this much at least. So the, these templates are very clean syntax. All they do is you have the function parameters on the right hand side. You get an extra set of parameters for the compile time. That's, that's all there is, the highlighted part. And this min, as opposed to C++'s huge number of specializations for it, works. This is just the implementation of min. And then you can have a struct template where you put a parentheses, so you parameterize your struct type, and done. Then you can alias a point to saying, here's an instantiation of it. Okay, eponymous template. So templates actually don't get fooled by this simple syntax. They are actually, there's a template keyword in the language. That one is lowered down to this one. So act the actual syntax is, you say template, give it a name, the template parameters, and you do whatever you want in there. Not only one function, you can put many stuff in there, structs, declarations. And notice this min doesn't have template parameters. So the template parameters moved up here. So this is the actual syntax. And I mention it because 
Look at this crazy template now. The template is named foo at the top line, and it, ha it takes, note the arguments that it can take, a type, an int value, a string value. So strings are template parameters in D. It also takes an alias as a function. Alias can be any symbol in your program, where I will show you one example now. And look, the template body itself imports a module has a variable declaration there, count, and it has two functions inside, depending on the template arguments. So this whole of three things is packaged as a template waiting there to be used. And then this, I can do this. So I can alias an instance of it with long 42 hello, and here's a lambda. That lambda has an anonymous symbol in the program. That symbol is moved as the alias parameter there. And that f itself has these functions in it now. I can say print, print, report, and I, I execute those in this instantiation of the template. We have template constraints. I think these are the concept lights in C++. When you define a template, you can say, I allow any type as long as it's convertible to long, or here's copy from a range to another range. Copy works only if Input type is an is input range and output type. We have variadic templates, as you would expect. args dot 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 is any combination of all the template arguments there. Now, if you for each range for over those things, the body of the for each is unrolled necessarily, because that args can have types, numbers, you know, values aliases in them, you have to, it has to unroll them, you can't compile it one way. So if you say print all 1, 2.5, hello, that code is actually unrolled to be this, necessarily, if you think about it, that's the only way. Oh, this is an unbelievable thing, I remember this just last night. You can use your user-defined type as a template argument. So, so this foo is a template function, and s, notice, is not a template parameter. It says, I want an s value here, s being a struct value. So you can instantiate in your foo with this specific literal at compile time, and it works. So these are the things you can uh, use as template parameters. Type, value, alias, as I mentioned, any symbol in your program. Okay, the, 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 finally the cool stuff. I needed three hours, apparently. So remember that foo crazy which had a count and two member functions in it? You can actually mix that whole code in any place you want. So here's a struct that's mixing in an instance of it, and suddenly this struct gains all those members. And here it is. Um, I say report, uh, I, I say five times print and then report, and it, it binds to that bar function in this case, not a lambda. So mix in is, so D sees it this way. Templates are code to be generated, and mix in puts that generated code wherever you want. Further, how about string code? Since we don't have macros, which there we can't generate string, uh, stringified code, but if you have a function like make struct def, that returns a string. So any string expression that can be compiled at compile time can be mixed in. The red part there is just a string, and I'm calling a function. Notice there's no template instantiation here. At compile time, I'm calling a function, regular decode, with this string and that value, and it returns a string itself where I don't mix in in this case. I pragma message, which means print at compile time, and it prints this struct definition for me. If I wanted, I could mix it in there, and then I would have a struct point. Um, so string mixing concept appears in uh, operator overloading in D. If I have my int, op binary is one definition. Binary operator is defined like this, and the operator itself comes as a string. So if it makes sense for my type, I can say return and then I can make that code, and suddenly I have the implementation of plus, minus, 
divide, multiply, all of them, because I can play with strings as code, and this saves a lot of time. Another one, opt dispatch. If you call a member function on a type, and that type doesn't have that member function, it doesn't error out. It calls your opt dispatch. And the member function name or member name calls, comes as a string at compile time. So here, I, that code, all that code style, I can ask for its color, weight, no way, something doesn't exist, and it compiles and works. Because in this case, everything is backed by a hash table there, associative array. Okay, when is my second session? <laughs> oh, Ellie's second. I have to show you this one. So all those template argument lists are actually available to you as an alias sequence. You can create an alias sequence on the alias A line, int, hello, whatever. So that's a list of things that you can pass to a template or you can slice and pass to a function. For example, here, B drops the first one off that list, so int is gone. C puts a double at the end, so C becomes this, hello42. And because full function can take int and double, you can slice the 42 and 2.5 part of it and call a function. So the compile time concept of a parameterized list, like a function argument, template arguments, or array elements, are available to you as alias sequence. You can play with them at compile time. This is a great achievement by Timon Gare. In two days, he hacked this feature into the language which is what we talked about actually, but there's, it's, there's a technical difference which I'm not getting into. You can create a range at runtime, at, at compile time, and statically unroll the body of it. We have traits, of course, <coughs> in the standard traits module, or we have the traits keyword, which you can learn introspections, lots of things about types and expressions. And we have compiles. So in the full function, you say static if, this expression compiles, and then I'm gonna do it, else you know what to do yourself. <laughs> so, I'll have to come back next year. I will, but, but let me finish with one word. If you take away one thing from this talk, it's static if, which I could not get to. <laughs> but I wanna go to the end, there's a very minor, tiny joke there, where I thank you. Thank you.